this little gathering of people here, uh, practitioners and master practitioners and a few trainers, uh, is to launch my new book, which is this book here, Legacy. And it's a book that's exactly what it says it is. It's the legacy of 53 years. When I started out, I really had no intention of doing any of this. Uh, I was uh, majoring in mathematics and, and what would now be called computer science. In those days, it wasn't even called that. And uh, inadvertently, because I was living in a house that was owned by a psychiatrist, I began reading books uh, that were there. He had a lot of books, and I kept reading them and thinking to myself, what a disorganized field. There were lots of books about what was wrong with people, but nothing that said what to do about them, other than to give them drugs. And then there were a few things, like a Gestalt therapy book and a few others, that had people doing things, but it didn't seem in any way to be directly related to whatever their quote unquote presenting problem. And especially in the case of identified patients, people who are schizophrenic and, or depressed or had phobias, that most of the stuff that they were doing all seemed to come from Freud. Freud had the idea that if you went back in your history, like an archeologist, that somewhere in the first five years of your life, something went wrong. And if you could find out what the traumatic event was and understand how you got to have your problem, that somehow or other, magically, it would disappear. Now, that had been tried for 100 years, and it's a great idea. It just didn't work. There were lots of people that understand that you know they fell in a river when they were a kid and became terrified of water, and they understood it perfectly, but they still couldn't get in water. And uh, the idea to me was that when I looked at the neurology at the time, what we knew, now we know much more about neurology than we did at the time, but my understanding of the way we grew cortical pathways, because you had to relearn, you had to re-educate yourself. You, if you moved from one house to another, you had to learn a new phone number. You couldn't keep telling people the wrong phone number. And if your friend moved, you had to dial the new number or you were never going to talk to them that the idea that you could re-educate yourself about information was acceptable, but the idea that somehow or other psychologically this was somehow or other manifested in some metaphorical thing, and uh, that the, the metaphors that they used switched. There were almost 160 schools of psychotherapy, and I started looking at all of them, and some of them were quite reasonable, and some of them were quite ridiculous. There was one where they just kept tickling you and talking about your problem. And, and, you know, and to them, success was when it got to the point where you urinated on yourself. And, and that was considered the insight. There were some where you hyperventilated and beat a mattress with a cane uh, you know, and screamed, mama, mama, mama. Some of them related everything to your parents that people would come in and say, you know, I'm terrified of heights, and they'd go, tell me about your mother. You know, and as a logician, this didn't make sense to me. Now, inadvertently, I got a call from the person that owned this house, the psychiatrist, and he told me Virginia Satir was coming. And she was a very famous psychotherapist. She literally founded the field of family therapy, very powerful woman, and was gonna come and stay, and they said, look, She's a city girl. She probably doesn't know how to light a fire. You know, you know, uh, you know when she gets there, she's going to come find you. I live next door and, uh, and see if you can help her out a little bit. And so I started asking her questions about what she did. And there were two things that were obvious. One, she had no idea what she did consciously, but she knew how to do it really well. And she also focused on getting results. She said, you know, she said, I, you know, I read all these psychology books, and she goes, I don't really understand any of it. She goes, what I do is I, I focus on looking at how the family creates the problem and then finding somebody in the family to change that will make the problem go away. And that literally, in over a thousand books that I read, was the first time anybody said anything that made sense to me at all. So uh, I, I said, I'd like to see you work sometime. And she said, in a couple of days, I'm going to see a family. And she goes, and she literally said, I don't drive very well. 
will you drive me there? And I understand Virginia was literally traveling on the road three, 300 plus days a year, traveling around the world teaching family therapy. So what, what I did is I drove her to Reno and literally on the way up, it's about a four hour drive from where I live, and the way up, she reached in her purse and pulled out a leather strap and handed it to me and she goes, this family has, she goes, the quote identified patient is a juvenile delinquent but also has epilepsy. And she said, I'm gonna talk to each of the family members, I'm gonna talk to the father last. And when I talk to him, she's gonna have an epileptic seizure. Put this between her teeth so she doesn't bite her tongue or choke. And I remember thinking that, that I thought, this woman can make somebody have an epileptic seizure? And I thought, man, I could use that. <laughs> I could think of all kinds of situations where I'd like to be able to do that. You know, that, that, wouldn't, wouldn't that be great? You go into that professor that doesn't want to give you a, a fair shake, you know. And he finds himself writhing on the floor, you know. Uh, just all kinds of things popped into my mind. And uh, sure enough, she saw the family. She talked to the mother. She talked to his sister. She talked to the girl who was, quote, the identified patient. And then she turned around. And the father was, a, I have to tell you, was a rigid prick. That would be my description. That's technical psychological talk. He, you know, this guy's asshole is so tight, I'm surprised he ever got a turd out of it. He was just Mr. Rigid tight. And Virginia turned around and looked at him. And she says, she goes, she goes, when I hear all the bad things that have happened, and, and you know, with your daughter running away and all these things, she goes, I look at you and all I see is a man who's terrified. Right. And he literally goes, he goes, I'm not terrified, I'm angry. And she said, no, you're not. She said, in fact, while I'm talking, I can see tears forming in your eyes because this is, you don't, just don't know what to do. And I feel very sorry for you. And the more I look at you, and all of a sudden he bursts into fucking tears. And this girl goes down with the epileptic seizure, like clockwork. And I'm a mathematician. I'm going click, 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 <laughs> click, click. And I'm going, this is so cool. And all the people sitting around me, and there are hundreds of people in the audience, start murmuring to each other. They go, she's so intuitive. Well, that's not what was going on. She knew what she was going to do before she got there. And she was supposed to be the person that just flew by the seat of her pants and did therapy unconsciously. But she had a plan. She'd worked with people like this before. And she knew if she could break this guy down, she could bring the people together and it would disrupt the system, right? And, you know, as she got the girl to get over the epileptic seizure, she got the family down on the floor and she got them to hug each other. And, and you know, and he started talking about being scared and the wife started talking about being terrified of his anger and all of this stuff, you know. And they started being nice to each other. Virginia literally had to train them how to be nice to each other. They had no experience. She, she, you know, somebody would say something and she'd go, what you're really saying is this. And it wasn't what they were saying at all, but she, it would have been a better choice. And she would kept doing this, and this went on for 45, 50 minutes. But the whole time, the response of everybody in the audience was to make comments that sounded like compliments, but they were really excuses. Now, I'm a mathematician who quantifies and qualifies language back then. That was... What I did, I designed little things for computers that it, it, so that you could, you know, if somebody said uh, just, you know that it equals the word only, you know, so that you're, you quantify language so that, you know, when, when you're making commands for compilers, th that it's telling a machine what to do so that it operates systemically. So when people were going, oh, it's just that she's so intuitive, right, the presupposition is, I don't have to learn this. This is not learnable. And yet it was so systematic that I, I, I was offended by it, to tell you the truth. So I decided at that point to take Virginia, and I started taping stuff that she did, taking the tapes, and got to the point where I could predict what she was going to say. Because it was so systematic, right? And, you know, even when she, somebody would give me a new transcript of Virginia, after a few sentences, I could predict what she was going to say next because she was very systematic. 
She did things that other people don't do, like she switched predicates. If somebody came in and goes, I can't see well, the, everything's going to change, she'd go, so your picture in your mind is blank. And if somebody went, I just feel frustrated, she goes, so it's got a lot of rough edges. She would switch from visual to kinesthetic predicates. So I started modeling these things with Virginia and then found Fritz Perls and did the same thing with him. And luckily, the same psychiatrist that owned this house also owned a publishing company, and Fritz had failed to produce a manuscript that he'd gotten a lot of money for. So given that I used to be a bouncer in a club, he sent me down to either get the money back or finish the book. Unfortunately, Fritz died uh, in the process of that. So uh, gestalt therapists always say that Fritz got real clear in the end of his life, but it was actually shortly thereafter because uh, I finished the book for him. Uh, that, but again, all of the gestalt therapy and all of these therapies still had the idea that insight produces change. And this book is a representation, and we keep using the phrase in it over and over and over again, the re-education. Because to me, it, it, it's all about learning. And, and on that trip with Virginia, I asked Virginia, I said, what is the purpose of what you do? And she said, people do the same thing over and over again because they don't have a choice. Till you have two things to choose between, you don't have a choice. And she said, my job is to give them a new way of doing things so that they can choose between the old one or the new one. And if the new one is better, typically people will make the better choice. And and psychologically, that sounds good, but neurologically, it's exactly what happens. So a lot of the techniques that you've been learning in your PRAC courses, so any of you that did the thing to banish, have most of you done the thing to banish bad, bad memories? All that, where you take a bad memory and, you know, that you see it constantly all the time and you put a border around it. Well, the minute you put a border around it, it's not a remembered image, it's a constructed image. You're now in a different part of your neurology. If you shrink it down and blink it black and white, what happens is the reason that suddenly people look at it and don't feel bad, they can still remember it, is that it's not the same picture and it's not connected with the same feelings. And that neurological pathway, if they do this, uh, seven to ten times, you grow a new neural pathway if you're in a good state. If you're in a freaked out state, it will take a hundred times. It's just the basis of neurology. Neurologists figured this out. This is why children play all the time and giggle and laugh and learn. Uh, something the school system has completely missed out on. You know, the school system thinks you have to sit rigidly and learn in a state of unpleasantness. I now feel bad, I'm ready to learn new things. Here's a big ass word, learn to spell it and feel bad while you do. Okay, that requires a hundred repetitions. And basically what you learn is that you hate that word. Um, but you know, when, when people are in a state because there's a neurotransmitter called oxytocin, and when, when you give uh, autistic children who have learning tr trouble learning, they can't tell the difference between an angry face and a happy face. And when they give them artificially oxytocin, th what happens is they immediately begin to pattern and recognize the difference between things. Because we learn by patterning. If you draw stick figures on a card, right, and you go you can see somebody run down the street and put a basketball in a hoop. But if I hand you one of those a week, for, for a year, you'll never put the pieces together. You won't see the changes. We learn by patterning, by pushing things through quickly. And a lot of NLP techniques, we, put, we run things through quickly in a new direction to try to build the cortical pathways. There's a guy named Albert Turing, who is a very famous Englishman that designed the, the memory systems for the original computers when they were in gigantic buildings. And a Turing machine is kind of like plates in a cafeteria. When you put the first plate on, it goes down, and the second plate goes on top of it, and the third plate goes on top of that. Well, our memory is a lot like that. We have a phone number, and then we grow up and move. We get a new phone number, and 
new phone number or we buy a new cell phone and get a number. And eventually, you know, got seven or eight plates, you never see the first one. Well, psychology wants to go back and find the first plate, you know, to help the t plate on the top. And when it comes to emotional issues, you know, bad things that happen, traumatic experiences, they stand out. The stronger the feelings, the more vivid the memory. And a part of the reason people come back with post-traumatic stress is that they've been in a high state of adrenaline for years. And when they come back, things don't feel real to them. They don't feel as connected as they were with the people that were trying to keep each other alive. And when they train them to be soldiers, they don't train them to come home. So I've had a lot of vets over the years, and a big part of what I have to do is reduce the intensity of those pictures and put their family up bigger and vivid. And, you know, if I can do that in a state where they're not stressed out, in fact, this is part of the reason I tell a lot of jokes, I get people in a good mood, you know, I point out the ridiculousness of life, which is usually enough to get anyone to laugh, you know. And if I point out the ridiculousness of the therapy they've been through, that always helps. Let me point out one thing. What? Point out this. Still have problems. <laughs> Pointing out. Oh, okay. Thank you. So half the society is gone. <laughs> this is why it has my name on the certificate, because Richard Bandler certifies. <laughs> Right, and uh, that parts of the society have disappeared. There are people who have become trainers because they own a printer. And, uh, but the one thing they can't be is licensed. Licensed printers, licensed practitioners. So those of you who are a licensed practitioner, double the size of the word licensed on your business card. Right, and that circle R, make it big. Don't, not a little tiny circle R, but a big circle R. That's a registered trademark that shows that I have endorsed the training that you took. That there are, you know, the trainers that are in this room know that I put a high value on what I've taught them. And, and believe me, I, you know, I try to be as thorough with my people as possible. Even when I get somebody who's been trained by somebody else, I go through the list and find out what they know and what they don't know. And what they don't know is sometimes a lot larger than they would ever believe. You know, out of the things that I think are just what it takes to be able to teach a practitioner course, some people are missing over three quarters of them. You know, they, and they may know the meta model, but they don't know how it works, right? Which is a big deal, because if somebody comes in and goes, I'm depressed, and you ask about what, who cares? That's, you know, that's not, the, that's, that's not gonna get you anywhere. It might be in the meta model, but it's not how you use it. You always go for the biggest chunk so that you can get the biggest effect. So if somebody comes in and goes, I'm depressed, I always look at them and go, how do you know that? Maybe you're happy. And they always go, I don't think so. And I go, yeah, maybe you're happy. And they go, well, my, but my psychiatrist said, and I said, has he ever lied to you? <laughs> you know, I want to know what they're doing, what the procedure is, so that if I were to do the same thing, it would make me depressed. Because to me, that rule of thumb, this book has rules of thumb in it. And these are the guides I use because for 53 years, the way I have expanded my skills is not by doing the same thing over and over and over again or defending a theory. Because these 160 schools of psychotherapy all were screaming they had the right approach, right? The neo-Freudians, the Freudians, the Gestalt people, the TA people all had the right approach. But yet not one of them, listen to this thing, not one of them could systematically get a consistent result with any symptom. Phobias, nothing, not anything. There wasn't one example of, I, I would ask them, I would go, is there a kind of patient that has a certain problem that can come in to you and leave without it? And they would all get twitchy and go, well, it doesn't work that way. Again, psychotherapy is all about building a bond between the therapist and the patient that's stronger than anything that they have in their personal life. So that you have this bond of trust so that you can explore and peel away the layers of their personality. And, you know, and 
I'm going, personality is a novelization. It's not a, it's not a thing. You can't feel it, you know, unless you're some kind of a psychopath, of course, and then you get a big sharp object and peel away the skin looking for the personality. You know, that's, that's not it. We, we have beautiful brains capable of learning, and it learns good things, and some of what it learns is just crap. That's, face it, you know. We grow, we grow up in, you know, weird times. I can't imagine the shit people are learning now in school, you know, with, uh, you know. First we desegregated the world, and now we're resegregating it. Uh, it's some crazy-ass stuff going on in schools. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, but I, I, I'm, the, I'm that guy that reading, writing, arithmetic, you know, when I tried to build a school at one time, which I was not allowed to do because even though I had geniuses working at the school, they didn't have teaching credentials and the union was again it. And, uh, you know, I had people like Buckminster Fuller and people who had committed time. The head of an orchestra was going to teach music to five-year-olds. You know, so that they would actually learn to play and, you know, we were going to give them strategies to learn music and strategies for art and strategies for architecture. So by the time you graduate from the sixth grade, you could pick a subject and read about it. Because, you know, once you learn to read and you learn to think so that you can solve problems. My last book, which is about problem solving, is actually a rewrite of my first book. Because when I wrote The Structure of Magic with John Grinder years ago, we did not realize what we were doing. Uh, we just wanted to model what successful psychotherapists did. And we built a model of, of, of it took Noam Chomsky's model of language and then found out how it became applicable as a tool to gather information. And it turns out it's a problem solving tool if it's used correctly. And over the years, I've used it to solve lots of problems. This particular book has got different things in it. And it's, they're not protocols in the sense of this is how, exactly how you do it. I know a lot of you have just taken a PRAC course. The PRAC course has protocols. Well, if they have a phobia, you do this. And most of the time, it'll work. The interesting time is when it doesn't, right? Now, I'll give you an example. Uh, an example, I'm in London, I've got 500 students in a year-long course, and towards the end of the year, somebody comes up to me and says, that guy from India, you know, the tall Indian guy? And I said, yeah. He said, everybody has tried to get him over his phobia. He can't ride on trains, he can't go in cars, he can't ride in taxis, no public transportation whatsoever, anything that moves with wheels, he can't get in. You know, he can't fly in a plane, and he said, and He's been complaining because his father in India is getting sick and he wants to go home and visit him, but he, you know, he can't even get to the airport, can't go on the, the tube in London, nothing. And he said, and everybody's worked with him, and, they said, and he said, you either have to fix him or I'm going to kill him, because everybody is frustrated. So I, I brought him up on the stage and I said to him, I said, well, a lot of people have tried to cure you of a phobia. And he, the first thing out of his mouth is he goes, I don't have a phobia. I'm cursed. And I said, I beg your pardon? <laughs> and he said, I was cursed by a witch. And so every time I try to get on these things, you know, it, the curse kicks in. So he didn't really have a phobia. He had a stupid belief, okay? Or he had a real curse, one or the other. And I didn't care which. I figured I could do both. <laughs> right? So I, I literally went in and decursed him and rebeliefed him. <laughs> And then stuck him in a taxi and had him ride around town, <laughs> right? And when he came back, a couple of the students came in and said, so you're saying it wasn't a phobia? I'm saying, look, if the phobia protocol works for a lot, but nothing works for everything. You know, when there used to be something we used called six-step reframing, and a lot of people began to believe it was the only technique that would work for anything. And so they, they literally, that's all they would do all day was this reframing technique. And if it didn't work with somebody, they would blame the person, which is what psychotherapists did in those days. If, if you weren't getting better, it's because you were resistant. If you weren't getting better, it's because you weren't ready yet, even though they were still taking your money. Um, you know, those kinds of things, I hear these flaws in the logic of the whole thing. Now, to me, the... The, the thing is, is when something doesn't work, 
it tells you, well, it works with this, but what's the difference? Part of the reason I started is everybody who talked to me about hypnosis, you know, in those days, this was in, I was in California at the time, and, you know, there were lots of different schools of psychotherapy. And when I found out, my next door neighbor was a very famous Englishman, and he told me about Milton H. Erickson, the hypnotist. And so I went out and started buying hypnosis books, because I figured, you know, if I'm going to beat the best hypnotist in the world, I should know something about it. So I, I went into used bookstores and bought used hypnosis, old books from the 1800s, and bought new books, you know, and, and read all these books. And then started asking the people that I knew who were doing psychotherapy or psychiatry about hypnosis. And they all went into this weird state. They would go, hypnosis is bad and it doesn't exist. Which seems to me as a mathematician to be a little contradictory. Just, just a little contradictory. <laughs> and, and, and then they would say, and if you suppress a symptom with hypnosis, it comes out somewhere else. Now, you don't tell a mathematician that without getting them excited, because that's all we do. We squeeze these numbers, these numbers change. That's what we do. And that was like, and I would go, cool, you know. And I started trying things with people to see if I could do it on purpose. You know, I, I literally would, I had a guy with hysterical paralysis, and I went in, and, and first I moved the paralysis to another leg. Right, and then, you know, just to see if you could suppress it and make it come out somewhere else. And got him up and he limped with the other leg and he got mad at me. He goes, he goes this is not funny. And I went, well, actually it kind of is, <laughs> right? And then I moved it from his leg to the psychiatrist's leg. And the psychiatrist started limping around and he goes, this is, this is not funny. He goes, I brought you a patient and now you're making me look like a fool. And the patient says to him, well, it is kind of funny, <laughs> you know. And then I took it out of the psychiatrist's leg and gave the patient, I told him, you'll have the best directions of any man who ever lived, right? And the psychiatrist said to me, he goes, you can't suppress a symptom and make it come out somewhere good. And I, I said to him, and I said, where is it written? You know, I've read almost every religious text that's ever been written. There was never anything that said, you can't suppress a symptom and have it come out somewhere good because Everything works to do something. Even phobias could be really useful. You know, I, you know, I was collecting phobias for a lot of years, and then one day this guy came in, and he was just a horrible heroin addict. He did stuff with heroin that was just, you know, he, 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 he shot it into his penis. Right? He took injections and shot heroin into his penis because it was such a rush. And, you know, and I don't know, in my world, I don't think penis needle, you know, <laughs> that's not a natural transition to me. I don't even know how I came up with this idea, right? And, uh, and you know, and he snorted it and he shoved it up his ass. He did everything with it. He was, he was a musician and he's worth hundreds of millions of dollars and he's killing himself. And, I, and, his, and his manager says to me, if I could just get him to stop for a while. So I put him in a deep trance, and I had his, his neurologist set up yes-no finger signals, and I said, you know, do you remember the most terrified this person has ever been in their entire fucking life? And I got yes, and I said, could you multiply that by 100? And I got yes, and I said, now, every time he looks at heroin in any way, shape, or form, let alone tries to put it in his body, I want you to generate this response until he's clean, right? And I said, are you willing to do that? And I got, yes. There was no hesitation, by the way. His unconscious was pissed off as much as his manager and his family and the band and everybody else. And so when it came out, I, I asked him, I said, do you have any heroin on you? And he, he lied. He goes, no, no, I, no, I don't. And I used to have a dog that could sniff out drugs, so I told the dog, I said, I said, where are the drugs? And the dog went over and started sniffing his pocket, pulled out a baggie with some stuff and a little spoon and all this stuff. And the minute I pulled it out of his pocket and he saw it, he went white as a sheet, just shaking, terrified, right? And he goes, get that away from me. And I thought, mm-mm, the phobia becomes a good thing. 
right? Not everything he's going to have to eventually learn to control his choices and make better ones. But as a stopgap measure, because he was going to be on tour the next day, it wasn't like I had a long time to detox him and stuff. And, you know, and I also had to put him in a trance and make it so that when he went on stage, he was normal and not going through withdrawal. Because most of the drugs that people take, you can induce the state in them as well. You can hypnotize somebody and make them drunk, right? And so, you know, we've, we've done this with people who can't take pain, you know, have taken some kind of a painkiller, but they keep taking it and it screws up their mind. We, 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 we get, we set up reinduction signals so that their painkiller will just kick in. So they get the effect of the drug, but none of the, none of the narcotics. Um, we've been doing that kind of stuff for years. There's a guy named Ed Reese, who's an NLP trainer in Florida that uh, kind of came up with this in a seminar one time. And I, I walked in and he was having some 70 year old lady and he said, well, what, what's your favorite drug of choice? And I, I just like that. And I thought she was going to say marijuana or something like that. And she goes, she goes, she goes, she goes, she goes, she goes codeine. Right. And, I, and he went, right. And he goes, where's the first place in your body you feel codeine when you swallow it? She goes, well, she goes, I start to get this tingling in my fingers and then it kind of spreads on the hairs of my arms. And, and he had her cycle through it four or five or six times. And pretty soon she was high as a kite. Her pupils were dilated. Her shoulder pain was gone. Uh, so, you know, the body memorizes all states. So if you ever took the LSD, your, bo your body can remember the order in which you started to notice it and put you in the state. And since your brain generates lysergic acid anyway, you can go into the same state and come out of it just as quickly, which is always nice. And our ability to affect our kinesthetics, our ability to affect our choice, our ability to make things work for us or not work for us is what I've been exploring and so when I set up my practice, I got a group of psychiatrists, and I would literally ask them, I'd go, what's the hardest thing? And originally they said phobias. So I went out and found a bunch of people that got over phobias and found out how they did it on their own without therapy. You know, what was the mental process and then recapitulated the mental process. And basically they looked at themselves one day doing this over and over and over again and got sick of it. They go, they go, I'm just so tired of being this stupid and looking this stupid in public, right? But while they were looking at it, they were still seeing whatever the object was. So if it were, I had a race car driver, terrified of escalators, can get in a car and drive 250 miles an hour, bumper to bumper with all of these things around on the track, but he can't drive, get up an escalator. He walks near one, his legs give out, you know. And he said to me, he said, I said, why, why are you coming to me? And he said, I thought about my son. My son is now a baby, but in a few years, I'm going to be taking him into a shopping center, and he's going to see me fall apart in front of an escalator. And he said, either he's going to learn to have my problem or he's going to laugh at me. And he said, the last one scares the hell out of me. And I said, good. Good place to start. Now, luckily, we were across the street in Hollywood from a shopping center that has five escalators going up. Uh, some of you have been to Hollywood, you know exactly what shopping center I'm talking about. And it's right across from the Sofitel Hotel. So I took him across the street, and he couldn't even look at it. His legs shook like crazy. And then I had him look at himself, being afraid, and get fed up with it. And then run the, 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 the idea that he was forwards and backwards in his mind so that he was coming down the escalator and getting more normal as he walked backwards out of the building. Because we don't normally run our neural cortical for things forwards and backwards. And when you run them backwards, it flattens them out. And they don't run automatically so easily going forwards. It's a neurological trick. Most of NLP's basic practitioner things are not psychological things, they're neurological tricks where you trick the neurology into having two choices. And typically, people will pick the one that feels the best. That's just the nature of human beings. That's how people get hooked on heroin. It feels better than their normal state. But if you can make it feel a lot worse, 
then they'll go for the normal state. <laughs> and now if you can give them a state that feels even better than that, so that they have three choices, then you can get people to give up drugs. And most of the time, you know, when I got people originally, because there was a lot, a lot of stuff about smoking in the 70s and the 80s, everybody smoked. I mean, they were smoking on TV. I remember being in the doctor's office and having the doctor smoke. You know, there were ashtrays in the airplane. Uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, every, everybody smoked everywhere. And when they were trying to cut it down, there were all these smoking clinics where they'd take 10,000 cigarette butts and put them in a hot tub and shove you in the hot tub and, and you know, so that you would just be this horrible smell of nicotine, you know. And then you'd see people get out and they'd shower off and they'd go outside and light up a cigarette, you know. <laughs> They go, God, that was awful, <laughs> you know. And, you know, my, my approach was different. I would look at them and I'd go, look, can you, is it possible for you to see yourself in your own mind walking through a room full of people who are smoking and not wanting a cigarette? Can you, can you imagine it? And they go, well, I can imagine it, but I couldn't do it. And I go, but it, when you look at it, is it life size or is it just a little tiny picture? And they typically go, well, it's a little tiny. I go, well, make it life size. And let me ask you, do you want to be this person? Would you want to have this control? Because if you could do this, it really would mean you could do anything you put your mind to for the rest of your life. Because right now you think it's impossible. And when they, they look at it and they go, yeah, I really want it. And I go, do you want it as much as these cigarettes? Right, because if you make it bigger, maybe twice as big as life size, maybe brighter, right? And you keep adjusting the internal image and holding up the cigarettes and going, which one do you want more? Until they want this more. And I literally tell them to wet their lips, which is a neurological thing about wanting things, food, all kinds of things. But you even see it when, you know, people are about to get in a concert, they've been waiting for three hours, just before the doors open, you can watch them wetting their lips, mm, or here, it's time, we're gonna go. I want them in that state, and then I want them to realize in that state, because that's the point I'll hypnotize them, not to make cigarettes taste bad. I tried that once, and it backfired on me. I hypnotized somebody, and I, I asked them what the worst taste they can imagine was, and they said cod liver oil, that their mother, when they used to swear, used to take them and pour cod liver oil in their mouth so they wouldn't swear. and. Uh, so I hypnotized this guy and I made it so that cigarettes would smell and taste like cod liver oil. And he came back the next week and I said, have you smoked? And he went, no, not at all. And then he reached in his pocket and pulled out cod liver oil. To me. <laughs> Stuck it back in his pocket. And Richard went, wrong. <laughs> we need to redo this. That education didn't work. We need to re-educate him. So what I started doing was getting people to go, look, pretty soon you're gonna to start to feel withdrawal. And when you felt withdrawal, every time you've tried to smoke, you think feeling withdrawal means you want a cigarette. And they always go, yes, and I go, I go, that's not what it means. It means you're doing exactly the right thing to make your dream of being a non-smoker come true. So every time you start to feel withdrawal, you should get excited, you should be happy. And I would induce that hypnotically so that the minute they start to feel withdrawal, they, go, they take one deep breath and let it out and they start to feel really good about themselves. They get an endorphin rush, which is what they get from smoking anyway. So the endorphin rush comes from getting through withdrawal because three or four weeks later, they'll be a non-smoker with a big picture of how they're gonna be better than they ever were and then all they need is new pictures so that they have better dreams other than where am I gonna get my next cigarette? Where am I gonna get my next candy bar? Where's the next piece of cake coming from? Where am I gonna get my next fix? Uh, and now they have drugs and everything. You gotta be aware, drugs will kill you now. You know, when in the 60s, they wouldn't kill you. They'd get you to be stupid, but they wouldn't kill you. You know, but now, now it's a death sentence, apparently. Uh, Glenda knows the police captain of the police department, and he was telling me all of his police now have to carry Narcam with them, you know, so because they, they're finding people dying all over the place. Somebody gives them candy, and it's filled with drugs that come across the border. So we have to teach people to be smarter. 
This book is about teaching your clients to be smarter. And for 50 years, I took cases of people who had been given up on by everybody. Uh, sometimes I did outrageous things, especially early in my career. I did some crazy ass stuff, I have to tell you. This book is not the crazy ass stuff. This book is when I got beyond doing crazy stuff <laughs> and found easier ways of doing things. It's got four very long transcripts of hypnosis from which you can learn hypnotic techniques. And in fact, when we're going through the protocols and it says this is you know, a good time to set up finger signals, there's a QR code that will jump you right over to the place where I'm setting up finger signals and you can watch a video of it. Uh, this is a learning tool because to me, the reason this book is called Legacy is that you guys are the legacy. What I leave behind should be your guys looking at the difficult things as a challenge, looking at when the phobia cure doesn't work, ah, this is where I get to learn something new. This is where you pull out the old meta model and start exploring, finding out new techniques. I read everything I can about neurology and most of it's useless to tell you the truth because they're just describing that the brain is there and it's got this, it's got that. But every once in a while, one of these neurologists my favorite part of the articles that, that they write in journals is there's a little section in it about quirky stuff that happens, right? And literally, this is how we discovered accessing cues. I read that there's an article by a woman named Dorothy Kimura. I actually quote her in The Structure of Magic. She attached little things to the eyeballs because the eyeballs jiggle all the time. He said, put a picture of a White House and attached it to the eyeballs, and after a few moments, since the picture moves, it disappears, because it's only because the eye moves that you're able to see, because the neurons will wear out if you keep firing the same neuron over. And she was proving that that was the case, and then she asked people, she goes, what was it a picture of? Because they go, the picture disappeared, and she go, what was it a picture of? And 85% of them looked up and to the left and went, it's a White House. And she said, this must mean something. So the, when I read the article, I went into my class at the university. I had 300 people in the class, and I said, what color are your mother's eyes? And all these people looked up, except the ones with the watches on this arm, the left-handed people, right? And they looked the other way. And, uh, and, and I went, whoa, there's a pattern here. So I started asking other questions. I said, what are the first four notes of Beethoven's symphony? And a lot of people did it out loud. I said, not out loud, in your head. Do you know what they are? And people would go, mm, 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 mm. <laughs> you know, And I said, what's the first thing you feel when you slide into a warm bath? And 80% and of the audience moved their fingers up to their midline and looked down and to the right. And I went, whoa, ho, said. And then I started listening and watching and noticing that people would do this and then use matching predicates. And so all the stuff about rep systems, it's in my old books and stuff. The development of me is represented by my books. You know, 53 years, 35 books, and a couple that I wrote that never came out. Uh, just one was lost in the lino press. I wrote a book and gave it to the typesetter, the manuscript. And she forgot to put the fixative in, and the book disappeared. Right. I had the notes. I could have rewritten it. But I write the books to learn things. And this book was mostly dictated, so most of it, it has QR codes where you can sit, because Juan and I had conversations. And uh, Juan would say, you know, you know, have you ever dealt with this? You know, teeth grinding, all kinds of things. And hypnotic skills, which, and hypnosis is a bad word, apparently. You know, there are people that go, it says in the Bible, hypnosis is a bad thing, and it doesn't, by the way. You know, these people, a lot of people use the Bible to justify everything. You know, the Bible says jet planes are bad. You know, <laughs> there were no jet planes, you know. You know, you know it's crazy and you know there's a lot of stuff about the Quran saying things and it says exactly the opposite if you actually read the book you know it, you know it, 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 it's it's pretty specific and but you know we modify our religions and our politics as we go along 
you know, it's, you know, the, uh, the United States, it, talk about equivocation, a university professor, right, who, who is now a college president, when they asked her in front of Congress, you know, do you think, you know, screaming about massacring the Jewish race is, is a form of bullying? And, and their answer was, it depends upon the context. So that's the slaughter of all Jews is, well, could be considered a good thing in certain situations. And in a way, it's right. I'm sure the Hamas people in the tunnels are thinking it. But uh, I, I don't think that a university professor probably could. But people use language to equivocate. They don't make good decisions. And our ability to help people to get techniques. See, the best thing about NLP is if you can get one thing that people think is impossible to happen. This is why I like banishing bad memories, getting people over phobias. If you can do that, you can also convince them that everything else that they think is impossible might well be. You know, people tell me they're not musical, and I bring them up on the stage and have them play in music in a matter of minutes, right? And suddenly, I'll ask the same person, I go, do you think you're musical? And they go, I might be. And I said, all that stands between you and being musical or being artistic or being poetic is having a good strategy to do it and practicing. And, you know, that, you know to say that, that one person's art is better than another is subjective. The only person you have to please is yourself. Right, it's, it, you know, it's a, it's a real difference. When I was in school, they had us all draw a fruit bowl, and I'd never even seen a crayon, let alone held one, right? The guy next to me drew a photograph with crayons. I don't know how he did it, but, you know, and mine looked like I sneezed crayons on the paper on it, you know, ground them up and went, you know. And the teacher came by and literally, you know, I'm five years old, looked at me and goes, you are not artistic. And I went, I am not artistic. <laughs> that was my first experience with hypnosis. <laughs> Decades went by, and every time I would walk by an art store or I would see somebody painting or drawing, I would hear this voice in my head, I am not artistic. <laughs> my first wife says to me, she goes, we were in front of an art store in London, and she goes, let's grab some art supplies and just sit and draw tonight. And I looked at her and went, I am not artistic. And she literally slapped me. Bang! She goes, what's wrong with you? She goes, that doesn't sound like you. And I went, I am not artistic. And I said, she said, let's find out. Because if you don't give yourself a chance, you know, to learn things, to figure out things, they have books. I found out there was a book just about drawing eyes. Right, you know, and, and you know all kinds of little details about how to do eyes. There are lovely now on YouTube. You can do everything. I offered to give one of my grandsons. It was going to learn to play the guitar. I said, I'll give you some guitar lessons, and he goes, I don't need that. I've got YouTube. <laughs> so grandparenting has been replaced by YouTubing. <laughs> but you know, he can go at his own speed. He can find the greatest musicians. You know, they're. They're on there showing you how to do things. Information is exploding. Intelligence is not. It's our job to make the gap. Those of us who are neuro-linguistic programmers, those of you who are going to do the work that I started and carry it on, have to constantly going to come up against where people say, it's just that I'm not the kind of person who. It's just that I can't. That word just means only. Right? I heard it when I started this, and I still hear it all the time. Right? It goes, I, I'm, I'm not artistic, I'm not musical, you know, I'm not patient, you know, I'm not this. You know, I, and people tell me, I'm not a good speller. It's not genetic, okay? You don't, you know, when you, it's not like there's a bunch of musical notes in, in your genetic structure that determine whether or not you can be musical. You know, you may not have the eidetic memory of Mozart, who, by the way, went to concerts at the age of five, heard the sounds, and saw the score, and could go home and play it, because he had really good eidetic memory, and he could play it out. 
When he wrote music, he didn't even do it musically. He did it visually and then played it to see what it would sound like. You know, that there are different approaches to all art forms and all problems in life. And, you know, I keep hearing that the world is going to end. It's been ending ever since I was born. In fact, it was ending before I was born. And there's a religion uh, that actually has a holiday they celebrate called the Great Disappointment because they all thought that the world was going to end and, they, and the second coming was coming. And so they all sold their farms. They didn't plant crops. And they all went up on a mountain. And sure enough, nothing happened. So the leader of the religion changed the date, moved it out a few centuries, and, uh, but they still celebrate it. They go, oh, the great disappointment, because they, they wanted the second coming to come. And apparently, uh, Jesus got distracted, I guess, you know, or else he looked at him and went, nah, 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 nah. we're not coming. <laughs> You'll be sorry. <laughs> Plant those crops. You know, don't take anything for granted. Your ability to learn the skills that you've learned, the meta model, the middle model, hypnotic skills, all of these things give you a foundation on which to explore. All of these protocols are a place to start. That's what they are. They're a place to start. And when you find out you don't know one of them, it, you know, this stuff will come up over the years. You're always going to have somebody who walks into your practice that goes, I can't stop grinding my teeth, right? Well, since they're doing it in their sleep, Right. Uh, sometimes they do it during the day, too. But, you know, they'll always go, I grind my teeth while I sleep. You can't really go about that consciously. You know, you really need to make some connection with the unconscious processes. You know, if you can if you can look at your alarm and set it for eight o'clock and wake up at seven fifty nine, it means that you can program yourself to, to carry out a post hypnotic suggestion while you're sound asleep. So, you know, this is the part of the person and the procedure and the machinery that you need to find and put to work to get them to relax their jaw. So that every time those muscles start to tighten, they sleep or not, take a deep breath, let the breath out, and let their jaw relax. I mean, I know it sounds obvious, but, I, you know, I've hypnotized over 100 people and had them do that. I've had people that have involuntary twitches and torticollis, you know, where they're jerking all over the place. And I've taken all of those motor programs and forced it into the smile. So that, and that every time it starts, it automatically rushes to the place. Because on the motor cortex, almost a third of it is about your mouth. You know, all those arms and legs and all that stuff only gets two thirds of the motor cortex. A third of it is about your mouth. And, you know, because that's where everything comes in, right, and words come out, and there's a lot of stuff, so it, it, there's a lot of space there to use. And if you can get, instead of twitching in the face and voluntary twitching, if you can get the unconscious to shift that into a smile, right, and then a deep sigh and relax, you can literally interrupt the process so that instead of, because people stress out about their things. So if I have somebody in a seminar and they're twitching all over the place and, you know, people are trying to ignore it. And the more they try to ignore it, the more stressed out the person gets. And I try to hypnotize the class and everybody's relaxing and they're back there twitching away. You know, I'm thinking to myself, I'm, I'm thinking, gee, if I can get this person to relax, Right, because I know everybody here thinks it's impossible. Then I can get them all to go, what about me? What, what do I think is impossible? Because whether or not she twitches, this, my seminar will be over. It's not going to affect my life, but it's certainly going to affect hers. It's going to give her more choices, and it's going to give everybody else the thought that, well, if you can see the impossible become possible, right, then then you have to go down your list of what, what can't be done, you know. And that's, that, for many people, is a very long list. It's not the stuff that you want that you don't have or the stuff that you don't have that you don't want. It's the stuff that you don't suspect. It's the things where you would never consider it that can really make your life delightful. Is there anything else I should add to any of this, Juan? We're perfect. We're perfect. Yeah. 
well, we're a work in progress is the way I put it. Yes. My t-shirt says work in project, progress. <laughs>